Welcome back, everybody, to another exciting edition of Western Civ 1. Today, we have another exciting edition. We are going to be looking at ancient Egypt, land of the Pharaoh, land of the Nile, and mummies. You don't want to miss this episode. So, grab a pen, grab a paper, a keyboard or a tablet, and get ready for Old Kingdom Egypt. Old Kingdom Egypt. Old Kingdom Egypt was focused around the person of the Pharaoh. These early pharaohs were immensely wealthy and powerful, yet they were not great military men. Explain how pharaonic, that is, of or relating to the pharaoh. So explain how pharaonic rule, the pharaoh's rule that is, in pyramid construction were enabled by Egyptian beliefs. Okay, so let's jump into things. And let's start by just looking at chronology. Sorry, I call this Old Kingdom Egypt. From very early time, even in ancient times, Egyptian chronology was broken down into periods. Today we're going to be looking at Old Kingdom Egypt first, and then Middle Kingdom Egypt. And in future weeks, we'll at least reference New Kingdom Egypt. Now, the Egyptians noted that you kind of had these periods of success, these kingdoms, and then they would be followed by intermediate periods. And this is kind of when everything went to hell and then things would be back again okay and so egyptian chronology is roughly broken down into these periods with these dates so to begin with we're going to begin with the way we always introduce a new place and that is geography where are we on the globe well when we're talking about egypt we're talking about northeast africa Okay, it's part of this fertile crescent region that we've talked about. And um, it occupies, Egypt occupies pretty much where the modern state of Egypt occupies. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about this region. And one of the things you probably know about Egypt is it's hot and dry. Um, Egypt is in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It's one of the driest areas in the entire world um, many parts of Egypt average about two inches of rain if you're not familiar with two inches of rain that's what we get on a really rainy day that's what most of Egypt gets all year okay so obviously not a place again where we're expecting to see great civilization emerge yet it does and largely for the same reason as Mesopotamia that's because of the Nile. Now, the Nile is the longest river in the entire world. It stretches a good part of the length of Africa. And it has two different branches. There's the White Nile and the Blue Nile. And they are different branches, and they come together around the modern-day city of Khartoum. Not cartoon, but Khartoum with an M. Well, not only does this river pro provide water to what would otherwise be a parched desert, but it deposits silt. And this silt is usually deposited about a quarter mile on either side of the river. And it's incredibly rich. It comes right down from Africa and it's deposited along the banks of the Nile and Egypt. It's very, very rich soil. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, in the ancient world, Egypt had the richest farmland. It was very coveted to have Egypt for all these ancient empires because it just produced crazy amounts of wealth. And so this um, alluvium, this silt, this thick black soil, it was one of the things that the Egyptians called their land. They called it Kemet, which meant 
Black Land to distinguish it from Red Land, which they called Dejret. Red Land, which is this land off to the side, which is completely barren. Now, the Nile, like the Tigris and Euphrates, has this period of inundation. Begins in early July. It reaches its high point in August and September. It completely floods out the area. And then it retreats around October, which is actually the perfect time because in these hot, dry climates, people tend to um, plant in the, in the fall. We associate fall with when you harvest, but it's the opposite in these hot, dry regions. So you plant in October once the uh, Nile has flooded, and you grow a winter crop, and you actually harvest in the spring. And so this is actually perfect. And so not only is it a great river in that regard, but it's also very navigable. You can uh, sail ships up and down it, something that's difficult in the Tigris and Euphrates River. So this is a great boon to the Egyptians. Another great part about Egyptian life is that it has these really good borders. We continuously mentioned in Mesopotamia these herders on the outskirts and, uh, and people coming in and out. Well, this wasn't a problem in Egypt because, well, it's surrounded by desert. So the Nile Valley is really fertile, but the ancient Egyptians didn't really need to worry about people invading them because the land around it just can't support anybody. It's really hard to get to Egypt in ancient times. Okay, so this, these aspects of Egyptian geography are obviously going to be very important. Well, let's talk a little bit about the origins here. Um, in Neolithic times, people began to settle around the Nile around 5000 BC. There may have been some Middle Eastern influence, um, maybe from Mesopotamia, that's debated. But it, one way or another, they, they uh, settled in these little farming villages, Neolithic villages, up and down the Nile. Now, in time, two distinct cultures emerged. The culture of Upper Egypt and the culture of Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt is so-called because it's low-lying. And Upper Egypt is so-called because it's um, more mountainous. Well, this Lower Egypt is based around the delta. The delta is this triangular-shaped area. And Upper Egypt is uh, a little bit further south. And in time, these two regions became rivals of each other. There were two separate kings, the king of Lower Egypt and the king of Upper Egypt. And um, so, you know, initially Egypt wasn't united. It was just this area of villages. And um, one of the things that's characteristic of Egyptian culture, which owes its origin to this, is the fact that there's a wicked lot of gods in Egyptian culture, like tons. And that's probably because all of these areas were originally uh, separate and had their own gods. And... Once it was unified, well, you, you, you know, they kept all these gods. Well, anyways, speaking of unification, unification is going to occur in, in um, Egypt incredibly early, like 3050 BC, right? While the Mesopotamians were still living in city-states, Sargon of Akkad wouldn't be for another 400, 600 years or something like that. Um, the Egyptians were unified, so, you know, they might have gotten a slightly later start in civilization than the Mesopotamians did, but they unified really, really early. Now, the identity of this first king of Egypt is debated. Uh, there's all kinds of different names and different traditions. The Greeks said it was a man by the name of Narmer. There's a talk of a scorpion king. But whoever it was, this king united Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Now, according to tradition, it was this king of uh, Upper Egypt, a king by the name of Narmer. And according to tradition, the kings of Upper Egypt wore a white crown. And you can see him here. He's the guy with the club 
in his hand. He's wearing that pointy hat. That was the king of Upper Egypt, and he's clubbing the king of Lower Egypt. And they tended to wear the red crown. And there's all kinds of symbolism here. We see the hawk associated with the god Horus, who would be associated with later Egyptians. And he's um, he's picking out a um, a reed, and that's a symbol of Lower Egypt. And so this this palette, this so-called Narmer palette from 3050 BC, supposedly shows this unification of Egypt. Okay. The early Egyptian state was powerful. It was the world's first territorial state. We talked about territorial states as opposed to city-states last week. We talked about it in association first with Sargon and then Hammurabi, and it took Mesopotamia a long time to get there. But Egypt, as I said, they got, they got off on uh, the right track very, very early, like 3000 BC early. And this was probably because urbanization had not really progressed yet in Egypt like it did. In, Mesopotam uh, um, in Mesopotamia, we saw that each city-state had its own traditions already. Well, Egypt probably unified while it was still mostly villa villages. So there's nothing quite like the city-states of ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. They probably didn't have a strong local elite, kind of like the Mesopotamians did, that were always chafing to throw off kings. And so Egypt was really a nation of villages at this point, united by a pharaoh. And so Egypt was essentially like a giant city-state, right? So the city-state had uh, the city and then surrounding farm farmland. Egypt was a lot of farmland with one major center, and that's where the pharaoh lived. And early on, that's going to be the city of Memphis. And so all these, this agricultural wealth that we talked about in Egypt, all of the crafts of Egypt, they're all going to be really at the, the Pharaoh's disposal. And this is why he's such a powerful guy. And so under these Pharaohs, Egypt becomes an incredibly unified culture. And it has something like 900 years of stability, which is crazy if you think about it. 900 years under the same government. Now, we talked about administration in uh, reference to Mesopotamia. If you're a king and you have anything bigger than a city, you need an administration, people to kind of run it for you. Now, the word pharaoh means great house or big house. And this is an indication of the pharaoh's power and the resources at his disposal. Theor theoretically... All of Egypt was his, right? All land belonged to the pharaoh in theory. Now, of course, this land needed to be administered. And so the ancient Egyptians divided Egypt into different provinces or administrative territories. Um, these were eventually called nomes, N-O-M-E-S. And these early gnomes would have been run by members of the pharaoh's household. And these gnomes, they were responsible for taking care of irrigation, collecting taxes on behalf of the pharaoh, and making sure that the royal coffers were full. And so Egypt was a really centrally planned state, um, planned from the city of Memphis. Now, part of a big part of the pharaoh's power was the was related to Egyptian beliefs. I know I said the Egyptians had a lot of gods, but some of the most important gods related to the myth of Osiris. Now, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of this story. Um, Osiris was regarded as the king of the Nile. Or the god of the Nile, I should say. And obviously, Nile's really important. Um, now, Osiris had a wife and sister, yes, incest. Uh, wife and sister by the name of Isis. And he also had a brother by the name of Seth. Now, I don't know why Seth got the dog genes and 
Osiris got the green genes and Isis has the normal genes. I don't know how that genetic pool worked out. But anyways, um, Seth, unlike his brother and sister Isis and Osiris, was a bad god. And according to the legend, at one point he tricks Osiris into getting into a coffin. Now, as your professor, I feel somewhat responsible for you, and if you pick up nothing from this class, I just want you to know don't ever get into a coffin because no good ever becomes of it. And sure enough, once he had Osiris trapped in the coffin, Seth drowned him in the Nile. And then to really make sure he was dead, he chopped his body up into 13 pieces. Well, his wife Isis learned of this, and she managed to collect 12 of the 13 pieces. And I'll leave it to your sick minds to guess which piece of Osiris she didn't find. Well, anyways, because Isis is the goddess of magic, she was able to bring Osiris back, minus one important piece of hardware. Well, Osiris was brought back to life and in a sense became the first mummy, first one resurrected from the dead. And his wife, he became associated with the rising and the falling of the Nile. And he became the king of the underworld because, you know, he had been brought back to life. Now, despite missing a valuable piece of hardware, the two, Isis and Osiris, were able to conceive, and they conceived a healthy baby hawk by the name of, Os of uh, Horus. And Horus is pictured here with the hawk head, and he did battle against his evil uncle Seth. And Seth is going to represent chaos. All right. And so Horus defeats Seth, he defeats chaos, and he brings order back to the world. And this is a really important myth in regard to the early pharaohs because pharaohs are going to be regarded as the embodiment of Horus, Horus on Earth. All right? And this is why pharaohs have so much power because it's not that they're favored by Horus. It's they are Horus. They're the embodiment of Horus on Earth. So now Mesopotamian kings, the kings of Mesopotamia might have been favored by the gods. Marduk liked Hammurabi a lot, but Marduk and Hammurabi were different. Mesopotamian god, uh, kings don't really claim to be gods. But in Egypt, the pharaoh is a god, like the most important god. All right? And so ha pharaohs are like half divine and half man. And so this is why they have so much power. Now, one of the things I mentioned is that Horus had brought order back to Earth. Now, the Egyptian word for order or harmony or justice is the word Mat. And Mat was a goddess herself. She's often per personified as this winged goddess. Now, it was the king's duty, it was the pharaoh's duty to maintain mat, to maintain balance and harmony. And he did this through temple ritual. And of course, Egypt's environment kind of took care of itself. I mean, the Nile always flooded and the sun always came up. But the ancient be Egyptians believed that it was the workings of the pharaoh who brought mat. And so it was really important that the pharaoh be there to take care of Egypt. Otherwise, it would go to hell. Now, death was a really important concept to the ancient Egyptians. Um, now, the Egyptian soul was pretty complex. There were a lot of different parts to it. But one part of the soul that I want to focus in on was called the Ka, K-A. And ancient Egyptians believed that the Ka was kind of like a spiritual double of you like a little version of yourself. And the Ka could survive death. In other words, there was an afterlife and it, it could, you could survive. But the Ka needed a body. In other words, once the body disintegrated, kind of your soul disintegrated too. And so the body needed to preserve, be preserved. Now, this idea of preserving the body
probably occurred naturally to the Egyptians because, well, in the hot, dry sun, the Egyptians would bury people in sand dunes, and it would probably naturally mummify bodies. Over time, though, the Egyptians learned how to do this artificially. It involved uh, removing organs and brains and this whole process that we won't get into. Also burying a person in natron, which is a type of salt that would leach the body of all kinds of fluids. It would be wrapped in a bandage. It was a whole process that took about 90 days. Now, the ancient Egyptians believed that everybody had a ka, but in the early days, only the pharaoh would enjoy an afterlife. Now, when a pharaoh was crowned king, the ka, the spirit of Horus, rested on him, and he suddenly got Horus's ka. And when he died, he would get a new ka. He would become associated with Osiris, the father of Horus, and he'd become god of the underworld. So in the Old Kingdom, only the pharaoh was assured an afterlife. And this is one of the reasons that a lot of nobles and everybody wanted to be buried near the pharaoh with the hope that if you get as close to the pharaoh as possible, you might... Um, enjoy an afterlife too and so people were naturally like attracted to the pharaoh because well you know everybody wants a good afterlife now the ancient Egyptians believed that it was really important that the pharaoh be properly entombed now early efforts at entombing pharaoh took place in something called a mastaba and the first few dynasties were buried in these types of structures. It was basically like a, a mud brick covering on top of where the pharaoh was buried. And the ancient Egyptians seem to have thought of this as like a future house for the pharaoh um, because they'd be buried and there would be a tunnel up to the house where the spirit could go and there would be storage items, things that presumably the pharaoh would need in the next life, and also, yeah, sacrificed servants too. Probably voluntary, but who knows. In time though, the later Egyptian pharaohs of the Old Kingdom began to improve upon this. And this was thanks in large part to a man by the name of Amenhotep. And he was the vizier, the chief minister of a pharaoh called Dozier. I think that's how his name's pronounced anyways. And Amenhotep was like a genius um, because he was the first of the Egyptian architects to use stone. And so this is one of the big things that's going to separate the monumental structures of um, Egypt from the monumental structures of the early Mesopotamians. The Mesopotamians didn't have stone. They used mud brick. But the Egyptians have access to stone. And so this clever Amenhotep stacked different levels of mastaba on top of each other. First, he presumably started with a regular stone mastaba, and then he said, well, let's build one on top of it, and then one on top of it. And by the time he was done, he had this massive structure for this King Dozier. And these early uh, pyramids, this first pyramid, step pyramid, measured 411 feet by 358 feet, and was 200 four feet high. It was huge. Think about how big 400 feet is. That's longer than a football field. And it was uh, that it almost squared. And 200 feet high is really freaking high. And so one of the things archaeologists look for is like different types of like burial practices, right? Like it's a big deal when they find uh, one skeleton with a gold necklace on it because it's like, oh, they, oh, this guy's a leader. This shows that this society was beginning to develop hierarchy. Well, we're talking about a structure as long as a football field. 
longer than a football field and almost as tall as one. So you want to talk about stratification. You want to talk about hierarchy. This is hierarchy on steroids. And um, so we can see just how powerful these pharaohs were. And this was really just the beginning of Egyptian pyramid construction because in time, pharaohs would build what we call true pyramids, these smooth-sided pyramids. Um, it's speculated that these were supposed to represent the sun's rays coming down from heaven. And it would be a way for the pharaoh's soul to ascend up to heaven. Now, the Great Pyramid, the biggest of the pyramid, was 756 feet long. Think of how long a football field is, double it, and then uh, add half to it. And that's how wide the base is on each side. And it was 481 feet high. It stood as the world's tallest structure for like 4,000 years, which is crazy. It had 2.3 million blocks. The average one ton. But some of them are as big as 50 to, uh, or as, weigh as much as 50 tons. And they look a little rough now, but in time, at their time, they were completely smooth and perfectly cut. I mean, this is like an immense undertaking. It's estimated that to build one of these things, it would have taken 20,000 workers 20 years to build. And you think about it, I mean, we're talking mag massive um, uh, logistical problems. How do you feed? How do you transport these things, all these workers? It would have been a massive undertaking. And the costs would have been just absolutely astronomical. Um, the Egyptians didn't even really have um, bronze tools yet at this time. They didn't have the wheel. And all these people that were building this, well, they had to be supported by other people because obviously they weren't farming at that time. And when you think about it, the, uh, we found over 80 pyramids. I mean, none of them quite as big as the, big, the Great Pyramid, but 80 of these things were built. And of course, the rationale is, well, the king needs to get back to the gods so that the new king can assume the throne so that we can have Mott. And, uh, you know... Uh, he can have a blessed afterlife and continue to look after Egypt from the grave. And so this was incredibly important to people. Um, so, yeah, we can just get a sense for just how powerful these, uh, these pharaohs were. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think for a bit, gather together your notes, and answer this question. Old Kingdom Egypt was focused around the person of the pharaoh. These early pharaohs were immensely wealthy and powerful, yet they weren't great military men. At no point did I, except uh, when I mentioned Narmer, did I mention these guys forcing people to do things. Explain how pharaonic rule and pyramid construction were enabled by Egyptian beliefs. And then go on to our second lecture.